Now we can go over to the capital, uh, Edinburgh, for um, details from Medibank, where indeed they are not happy. It is now half past four in the morning and nothing is doing. Ian. That's right. It's waiting for Godot here. It's uh, been a very long night and there's a good deal of uh, disquiet. I think we could put it no higher than that among candidates and a number of the party activists here that things appear to be going so slowly. Indeed, they went slowly at the general election as well. We haven't had any satisfactory explanation for why it's taking such a long time, except that there's the particular but, method they have here but of we let, let, counting let, the ballots. As far as the, uh, what we understand, uh, David McClatchy, the Scottish Conservative leader, has not won in Pentlands. We're almost certain about that. Mark MacDonald, though, appears to have done reasonably well in Edinburgh South, coming second. At least that's our projection at this stage. Well, we we'll understand, I understand, uh, Ian McWhorter, that originally Edinburgh prepared to count the next day, so perhaps they're just going on a go slow. Could be. Not a single result from Edinburgh, though. That is quite extraordinary. <laughs> it's, it's been a long night here. <laughs> well, it just makes for an exciting morning. Well, I suppose you could put it that way, yeah. But, I mean, I think, obviously, for, uh, for David McClatchy, it's been uh, a pretty gruelling occasion. Nevertheless, he will get in. He, he will lose in Pentlands, but he will almost certainly get in on the well, list. Thank Vote. you very much. Whenever we get them. Well, we, we can go from the sublime to the ridiculous now. The ridiculous is the sublime, I might say, because we've got Tom McCabe with us, who, of course, became the first member of the Scottish Parliament at exactly, I think it was 11.16 tonight. Uh, now, Tom McCabe, congratulations. Okay. I mean, you are the leader of the local council. Exactly. I mean, you tell people in Meadowbank, how did you do it to get those uh, boxes emptied, those rummaging done, and the votes uh, counted so quickly? Did you produce lots and lots of workers under direct labour? No, I think just good forward planning and I, I just hope that our new Edinburgh Parliament works considerably quicker than this count has in Edinburgh, but perhaps some people moving through from the west will be able to offer some <laughs> No, uh, no, 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 we don't need any of this uh, east-west uh, rivalry, for goodness sake. Um, no, but, I mean, 11.15 was extraordinary early. Yeah. I mean, did you double the amount of people that were there? No, it didn't. Actually, it was just uh, very, very good forward planning. A lot of practice beforehand. <coughs> you were practicing? Yes, I think they did practice beforehand, and they made sure that people came in and, and were prepared to do the work beforehand in order to try and be the first. So, I think it was about motivating the people who were actually employed there. Uh, they had a, a sweep amongst the, some of the workers who were working, and... Oh, so it's money that does it, it's gambling that well, does it. Well, it's a charity sweep, actually, so it's going to be a major <laughs> charity. But it was an incentive for people to try and make a little bit of history, so perhaps there's a lesson for other areas. And nothing to do with the fact the turnout was low and your majority was halved? No, nothing at all, no. Ah, yes. Well, we're joined now by Ian Hodgson, who is the SNP MEP for the North East. Um, you heard Alex Salmon there saying that uh, we, can actually, we can actually go straight over to Aberdeen Central. Ladies and gentlemen, declaring. before making the declaration for Aberdeen Central, constituency. Can I take this opportunity of thanking staff for the work that has been done both in the preparation for today's um, elections and in the work that's actually gone on during today. The preparation for this has been a mammoth task. Staff have been working on it for the last six months and they have done a superb job and I would want to acknowledge that now. Can I also take the opportunity of acknowledging the way that all the candidates in all the elections that have gone on in Aberdeen today have handled the situation. It has been a clean run campaign, it has gone well and it's a credit to democracy in the country. I think I have to say, from the staff point of view at least, the response of the public in terms of the turnout at the voting has been disappointing given the historic event that's been happening in Scotland today. Uh, well, here we have it. I mean, uh, Malcolm Bruce, they're also very fulsome in Aberdeen. I think we'll go away there and go straight over to Edinburgh South because there's developments in Edinburgh. <laughs> they're about to break their duck. Here is the result of the election in the Scottish Parliament constituency, Edinburgh South. The percentage poll was 61.6%. The votes cast for each candidate were as follows. William Down Black, Socialist Workers' Party, 482. Margot MacDonald, Scottish National Party, 9,445. Angus Mackay, 
the Scottish Labour Party candidate, 14,869. <laughs> Michael Stanley Robert Pringle, Scottish Liberal Democrats, 8,961. <laughs> Ian White, Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party candidate, 6,378. And I declare that Angus Mackay has been duly elected to serve in So Parliament there we have it. Um, Margaret MacDonald uh, failed to beat uh, the Labour candidate, but as she is high up on the Lothian list, she may well come back as a regional MSP. Looking at the share of the vote there, Labour on 37, SNP in 24, 22 for the Liberal Democrats, 16 like for the Conservatives, taking the change from 1997. Uh, Labour 10 percentage points down, SNP 11, 5 up in the uh, Liberal Democrats and 5 down for the Conservatives. Now, we can move on now to talk about another recount in air, which is perhaps the, the, possibly the tightest of the night. Brian, what's happening in air? Well, so far we understand that, that, that uh, Phil Galley, of course, who's the contender for the seat there, there's, there's going to be a further recount. It looks very, very close indeed. Now, we have the intriguing prospect emerging there that if Phil Galley could win that seat, he could be the, the, the one um, Conservative elected first past the post, and dare I say it, might he be in a position to challenge for the leadership of the uh, Conservative group within the Scottish Parliament? I say that in, in wicked fashion. I think it's a very, very unlikely prospect nonetheless, but uh, mm -hmm. it's an entertaining thought. Right, well, let, let's, uh, let's look at uh, another uh, per perhaps uh, single uh, constituency returner, and that might be Tommy Sheridan from the list uh, for the Scottish Socialist Party. Let's see what Peter makes of it. Peter, what do you think the chances are? Right, well, if Phil Galley can do it there, no Tories are going to make it in Glasgow. But well, we're going to have a stab now because the second votes are pouring in now all over Scotland, but in Glasgow we now have half of them declared. First of all, the constituency seats, the first past the post seats, all of them red for Labour, ten results in, all Labour, absolutely cleaned up. Now, the regional votes being counted up here. There we are, 69,000 for the Labour Party, 38,000 SNP, 11,000 the Tories, and 10,000 here the Liberal Democrats, and 21,109 over here for the others, including, of course, Tommy Sheridan. Now, there is the share that those top-up votes represent. So far, only five of the 10 seats properly counted second votes, but we can now get a very good picture. Here we have Labour cleaning up all 10 of the constituency seats, but look at the size of these shares here, with the SNP a quarter of the vote and no seats at all in the constituency group. So what happens? Here are the candidates down here for the top-up seats, the regional list candidates, and we can expect to see, now we reckon, uh, our estimate is that of the SNP uh, candidates, for example, Nicola Sturgeon will get the seat, there's Dorothy Graham Elder there, the journalist, and Gibson of White, they will take four seats, the SNP we reckon, Bill Aitken, the leader of the Conservatives on the Glasgow Council, will take one, and we reckon also Robert Brown, Liberal Democrat, will get one over here. Now, what about, what about this side of the picture? What about uh, Tommy Sheridan and his list of Scottish Socialist Party candidates? We reckon that Tommy Sheridan will take that seat, something like 7% of the vote, very, very close thing, but he probably will, and that means when you look at the profile of the seats along the bottom here, you can see that they just about match the profile of the votes at the top. So the SNP picking up four top-up seats in Glasgow, Kirsty. Thanks very much indeed. And now we can look at uh, the result in Aberdeen Centre. We had to cut away from that, so let's look at that. And that is Lewis MacDonald for Labour on 10,300, uh, Richard Lockhead uh, for the SNP on 7,600, Liberal Democrats on just over 4,000, Conservatives on 3,500, and the SSP there, Andy Cumbers, makes 523 votes. Now we can go straight over to Craig Armstrong, who's joined by the parliamentary leader of the Scottish National Party and safely returned uh, MSP, Margaret Ewing. Craig Anderson, sorry. Absolutely. Thanks very much indeed, Kirsty. It has been a long night, hasn't it? Yes, I am joined by Margaret Ewing, who is the parliamentary leader of the Scottish National Party. Margaret, congratulations. Thank you. You have good. held your seat of Murray and uh, now you are a member of the Scottish Parliament. Your vote, though, was actually down 3%. Labour's was 7% up in your constituency. The, tur the turnout was also down. And I think what was important here was that, in a national basis, the the whole argument over the Scottish Parliament was very much seen to be between the SNP and the Labour Party. And that obviously impacted to a certain extent in Murray. And there was also a strong, well-known local candidate. Um, but I think the important thing is that we held the seat 
and we held it comfortably. And the people of Murray have given me their trust to go to this new Scottish Parliament and to represent their views, their ideas. Now, we've discussed it already tonight with, with other people, but do you think Alex Salmon's comments about uh, Kosovo had any bearing at all on your result, given the, the RAF stations that are within your constituency? There's no doubt there was a dip at some point um, during the course of the campaign as a result of that, because I don't think people had analysed what Alec had said. I mean, he made it very clear that we supported our troops uh, in the action that they had been asked to, be, to, uh, to undertake. Um, we also made it very clear what we thought of um, uh, the Serbian dictator, uh, whom we see as an evil man. What we questioned, and what is now being questioned by many of the other NATO countries, is whether the tactics which were used were right. Um, I have personally always believed it should have been a United Nations mission which would have brought in Russia and China, and many people in my constituency agree with but that. But you think obviously some of the people in your constituency didn't vote for you because of those comments? But others did vote because of the comments. Um, so, I mean, in every party there are ups and downs during the course of a campaign and I don't think it had any significant impact whatsoever. Now, we've got a recount here in Murray and uh, obviously Butterflies, you've won, but your husband Fergus is still outside there, uh, you know, uh, the adrenaline pumping, wondering if he's going to be re returned. So it's now uh, waiting for that and back to the studio to you, Kirsty. Thanks very much indeed. Um, uh, first of all, Brian Taylor, just a point about the nature of the SMP, SM, MSPs. Yeah, what we're picking up here, of course, is that Margaret Ewing is one of the six members of the, the, the SNP group in Westminster, all six... Well, let's go over to Trump. Aberdeen North here, because Aberdeen's coming in fast Ian and furious. James Hawkey, Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, 2,772. <clears throat> Elaine Margaret Thompson, Scottish Labour Party, 10,300... <clears throat> 340. I hereby declare that Elaine Margaret Thompson has been duly elected to serve in the Scottish Parliament as a member for the Aberdeen North constituency. There we have it. Um, Elaine Thompson, Elaine Thompson uh, returned for Aberdeen, beating off an SNP challenge, but uh, her majority vastly reduced. Um, Brian Taylor, we're just saying the nature of the six SNP MSPs returned. That's right. I mean, six, six members of Parliament they have in, in Westminster. All six, uh, as far as I can calculate, have been uh, dispatched to the, the, the Scottish Parliament, which of course was, was their objective. But nobody else so far has managed to join them from the SNP ranks. The, the hopefuls like Nicola Sturgeon and uh, Alex Neil and uh, George Reid haven't managed to repeat the feat of the, the well-known figures who, who've uh, won the seats for Scotland that they hold, they hold at Westminster. Well, uh, turn to you, Ian Hudson, uh, just talking, uh, echoing what Margaret Ewing was saying there. She was conceding that Kosovo played a part. She had a three percentage point dip in Murray and she conceded that in fact Kosovo had played a part. I mean, you have a, there's Lossy Mouth and there's Kinloss, two strong military areas where I'm sure Alex Salmon's Kosovo remarks would perhaps have had a, a, a great deal of impact. Well, Margaret Ewing also said that uh, a number of people had voted for us because of our stance and once it's properly explained, as Margaret Ewing explained it there, uh, I think that more and more since uh, Alex Salmon made a statement, uh, he has been proved correct in many ways. What we have done uh, this uh, election so far uh, is we have uh, won all six uh, of our uh, current uh, Westminster seats. But isn't it interesting because the, one, the people that have got, as it were, the, the profile which extends across Britain for what, are the ones that get returned, and yet you would think that people would have confidence and faith in some of the people whose profile is limited to particular areas of Scotland. Well, we've had some uh, excellent results uh, across Scotland tonight and some considerable increases uh, in our percentage uh, vote. Uh, and I'm sure that that will uh, bear fruit uh, in the second uh, part of the election, which we're still uh, waiting for, of course. And I'm, I've no doubt that we will end uh, this uh, long night with a very, very substantial increase in our parliamentary position. The strongest position that the SNP has ever had uh, will be the outcome of this election but for us. But how, how do you think um, that will play in Edinburgh? I mean, how do you think the SNP will operate in Edinburgh? There will clearly be an opposition. Well, we're in, going into a new parliament uh, and clearly uh, all of the parties will sit down over this weekend and uh, weigh up all of the results once they're all uh, safely delivered. Well, at the moment, uh, we've got a situation where we um, have a second recount in D-West 
and indeed in Glasgow uh, we are only one result short of uh, the regional vote being declared so Brian Taylor that, that as uh, Peter Snow was indicating there that, that's going to move very quickly. That's when the moment the SNP will pretty well double the, the Scottish parliamentary group by the, the single act of declaring those regional uh, votes in Glasgow because if Peter is right and I'm sure he is they could pick up as many as five seats off the list. Tommy Sheridan could get in the Tories could, could pick up their, I think it's still their first seat of the night, isn't it? Um, on, off the regional list in, in Glasgow. And so the picture will be transformed by the arrival of those, those uh, regional figures. And indeed what we will start to see is uh, Tom McCabe, that uh, the regional vote for Labour could be as low as 35%, which is your worst showing since the early 1980s. I think the regional vote is very different and it remains to be seen exactly how it turns out. But I think the fact here is that you know, where the seats, where la la Labour's uh, heartland support lies, we still continue to pick up those first past the post uh, results. And whilst the SNP are increasing their share of the vote and there is a dip in ours, you know, Aberdeen though, Aberdeen, 10,000 majority to 400 majority. Well, you know, we've got 46 Labour seats here tonight and there's six SNP and the six they've got, I think, are all Westminster MPs. I think the signal that's being sent to people in Scotland tonight is that the SNP have increased dramatically. Uh, the share of the vote, but they cannot take that step to the, put, to the, to but, the point where they win first past the post seats. But people know that traditionally, when there's the ebb and flow of SNP politics, but traditionally, yeah. Labour has moved furthest in devolution when the SNP's been snapping at their heels. So having such a strong SNP presence, what will that actually do to the way Tony Blair approaches Scotland? I think Tony Blair has always approached Scotland in a very even-handed and fair way. It was Tony Blair's government, after all, that within, you know, that promised they would deliver a parliament for Scotland, and they've done just that. It was Tony Blair's government that promised they would deliver a more fair and equitable voting system for Scotland, and they've done just that. So I think his track record's pretty good, actually, in Scotland. But I do think the SNP have got a bit of a problem, because their argument in the past was always that they got eclipsed in a general election because it was a UK dimension. Here they have an election that's just for Scotland on an issue which you would have thought the SNP could really take to themselves. And they, so far, have not even managed to win a single extra constituency seat. Yes, they will benefit from the PR system, but in terms of what they ought to be able to do in this scenario, I think they really ought to think about this, because the people of Scotland have decisively said, we don't want so to... So what are you flip. talking about? Four devolutionary parties as opposed to three devolutionary well, it's parties? it's up to them what they decide party. to do, but what they've got to recognise is that there's a pretty clear indication that the majority of people in Scotland are really not interested in in independence and want to see the Scottish Parliament within the context of the UK really apply and work. And that's we can go straight now to Edinburgh Pentlands, uh, which is where David McCletcher, the, the leader, is standing. Uh, and uh, here from the returning officer there from Edinburgh Pentlands. Here is the result of the election in the Scottish Parliament constituency, Edinburgh Pentlands. The percentage poll was 65.72%. The votes cast for each candidate were as follows. Stuart Gibb, Scottish National Party, 8,770. <laughs> Ian Robert Lusk Gibson, Scottish Liberal Democrats, 5,029. Ian Cumming Gray, the Scottish Labour Party candidate, 14,343. <laughs> David William McCletchie, Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, 11,458. <laughs> and I declare that Ian Cumming Gray has been duly elected to serve in Parliament as the member for the so Scottish there we have Parliament it, uh, the Conservative in leader in Scotland, David McCletchie, doesn't make it into the Scottish Parliament by virtue of first past the post. Ian Gray is returned for Labour in Edinburgh Pentlands. That was the great hope for Conservatives in Edinburgh. Uh, Lawrence Strathclyde, great disappointment to you that David McCletchie will not go in as a first past the post MP. Labour there on 36% and the share, the change is <coughs> Labour down 7 percentage points, Conservatives down 3, SNP up 9. Liberal Democrats on three. That's the change from the 1970, uh, 1997 vote. Um, Laura Strathclyde? Well, it would be nice if we were winning some of these uh, first past the post seats. Uh, but of course, uh, very high David McCletchie is a very high turnout. David McCletchie will be a member of the Scottish Parliament by virtue of his position uh, on the list. So uh, the leader will be elected. The leader will be elected, and it makes no difference to you whether he's elected through the constituency or whether he's elected through the list. If there indeed was to be someone elected through the constituency, i.e., Phil Galley, 
uh, that would not change the pecking order? No. Remember, we decided, and we were the only party to do so, not to parachute people from the outside onto uh, the list. Everybody who stands on the Tory list is standing in a constituency. Brian Taylor. Some, some info coming in, first of all, from, from AIR. The, the recount there appears to be very, very narrow indeed, perhaps uh, single-figure votes separating them. But uh, with regard to the Edinburgh Pentlands result there, OK, David McCletchy will get through on the list, and he is entirely legitimately entitled to be a member of the Scottish Parliament. But look at it in terms of the party. This is a very, very poor result for the Conservative Party. This is a seat they held for decades under Sir Malcolm Rifkin. Their vote has gone down, and a, a, a candidate whose profile could scarcely be higher, the leader of the Scottish Party. Right, well, we're now joined by John Murray, who's the editor of the Scottish Express. Uh, good morning to you. Um, morning. How are you playing this in the Express this morning? Well, we have sort of followed the fluctuating fortunes uh, of tonight, I think, like yourselves, with, uh, with at times a degree of uh, surprise. For early on, obviously, it looked like uh, it was going to be a pretty good result for, for Labour. And when we, our first edition, we said sort of Donald has done it. Um, uh, this time, as the night has moved on, we've sort of we've had to row back from that as, as it appeared there was an SNP surge and now as the night draws even further to a close it looks like um, all in all in the end it has been a, a reasonable victory for the Labour Party. So uh, in terms of uh, newspapers PR elections are pretty disastrous? <laughs> Um, they're, they're, they're difficult. They're <laughs> difficult for journalists. I'm not sure they're bad for newspapers. It, it's at least kept us on our toes during the night because it could have been very dull um, if we hadn't had some sort of changing fortunes. When you look back then, the campaign, did you think you played the campaign right? Do you think uh, you got some measure of what was going to happen? I think the sad thing to say is that we'll, we'll be looking at the turnout. And uh, when you think of this, the campaign itself at times seemed rather dull despite being very fractious. And there was a sense, I think... But what do, when, you, when you say dull, I mean, everybody's intrigued, everybody's talking about a dull campaign, but what is an exciting uh, you know, election campaign these days? I mean, for a start, this one was, what, nearly five weeks long. I mean, you can't expect it to be exciting the whole way through, presumably. No, I suppose not, but it never really ignited. I mean, I think everybody was always waiting for one issue really to grip the imagination of the voters. Do you think, um, as a newspaper editor, that uh, the importance of Kosovo, which often knocked the Scottish election off the front pages, did make a difference? Yes, I think, I think it was extraordinary bad luck, if you like, uh, for, the, for, the, for the first election of the Scottish Parliament to take place while there was a you know, uh, major war going on, while there were lots of other big stories as well around, um, for example, I mean, in the last week, the, you know, the murder of Jill Dando and stories like that have, have, have all knocked the election off the front pages. We're just going to see that the Liberal Democrats have won Aberdeenshire, West and Kincardine. But b before I leave you, um, what tack will you be taking after this election in terms of uh, your support for which way the Parliament should go? Well, I, I mean, we like to think that we sort of, we, we played a straight bat during the campaign that we did come out for uh, Labour in the end. Um, I think now it's up to us to make sure, uh, to, 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 to hold the Parliament to account and to make sure that the politicians deliver what the people want, because what they clearly have said they, uh, they wanted is, is this new kind of politics in, involving more, rather more consensus than we've seen during the campaign. That doesn't necessarily make very good newspaper copy. Uh, it, it, it can do, because uh, sometimes I think perhaps the, the shift that has gone on in, in British politics and to, to an extent in British media is rather than talking about uh, one side, one paper being for one party and one for another, it's, it's us holding the politicians as a whole to account and that could be interesting. But um, um, if you'd like to cast aspersions on other uh, titles in Scotland, I mean, did you think that um, perhaps the Daily Record for example ran a very negative campaign against the Nationalists? Uh, uh, one thing that uh, I think is interesting out of the vote tonight is that uh, particularly in, in the west of Scotland as we've seen in central Scotland the SNP have not done too badly and that, that's because I think there's been a resentment um, by the voters at the sort of nature of parts of the Labour campaign and some of the supporters in the media have... Yeah, well, but do you think the media as a whole should perhaps take some of the blame for the low turnout then? Uh, I don't think so. I think quite the reverse actually. I think if anything perhaps we, have, we made a mistake by thinking this was... Um, of, of greater importance to more of the Scottish people than, than they've obviously felt it has been tonight. You know. So um, we've, we've been trying to ignite the campaign, I think, all along. And it has I'm been. afraid I have to interrupt you there because we can finally now get the result from Aberdeen South. We can go straight over to the beach ballroom. Oh, the Aberdeen Exhibition and Conference Centre, excuse me. As yet, we appear to have a minute's silence from uh, Aberdeen South. Um, we now have the declaration for Aberdeen South. As returning officer for the Scottish Parliamentary constituency of Aberdeen South, I give notice that the total number of votes cast for each candidate in this election was as follows. Michael Robert Elric, Scottish Labour Party, 9,540.
Irene Margaret McGugan, Scottish National Party, 6,651. Nanette Milne, Scottish Conservative and Unionist candidate, 6,993. Nicol Stephen, Scottish Liberal Democrats, 11,300. And Scott Craig Sutherland, Socialist Workers' Party, 206. I hereby so there we have it in Aberdeen Nicole South. Stephen that is only the second change of the night on the 1997 election. It's not a, it's not a gain because, of course, it's a different election. But apart from Dennis Canavan, Nicol Stephen now goes into the annals as only the second change, the second person to change the nature of a constituency. And there we have it on the share, 33% for the Liberal Democrats, 28 for Labour, 20 for Conservatives and 90 for the SNP. And the change there, 5% up for the Liberal Democrats, Labour well, and Conservatives down and 9% up for the SNP. Now we can hear from a delighted Nicol Stephen. Mr Returning Officer, I'd first like to thank you and all your staff who have been so busy and so efficient throughout the day at the polling stations and at the count tonight. I'd also like to thank the police and everyone else associated with the organisation and administration of the election. And not only for the work done today, but also for all the, the endless hours spent preparing for today's historic elections. I'd like to pay tribute to my fellow candidates. They fought a, a hard but always fair and good-natured campaign, and that is the way it should be. I know it may sometimes seem easy for a successful candidate to stand here and say to your opponents, I know how you must feel. But in my case, I think you realize it is true. Tonight's result in Aberdeen South is a tremendous victory for the Liberal Democrats. It marks the opportunity for a fresh start for Aberdeen, for the North East, and a fresh start for Scotland. But its significance goes much wider. Not only Scotland, but the whole of the United Kingdom will be different after tonight. Tonight, we're entering a new style of politics, a new era for Britain. The people of Scotland have said loudly and clearly that they don't wish any party to govern our nation with unlimited power. We're entering an era of partnership politics. I pledge tonight to do three things. First, to stand up for Aberdeen in the Northeast in the new parliament. There we have uh, partnership politics is a new uh, phrase from the Liberal Democrats. That's a significant uh, win for the Liberal Democrats, resting it off Labour. And now we can go straight over to Meadowbank, where Ian McQuirter is with the Scottish Conservative leader, David McCletchie. Ian. David McCletchie, this must be a very disappointing result for you. It's a personal disappointment for me, but it's a, a step forward, I think a major step forward for the Scottish Conservatives. We've reduced this uh, majority in uh, this uh, constituency. It uh, looks as though we might need two bites to uh, win it back in an election again. But uh, overall, I'm heartened at the performance of the party and the country as a whole. And I'm looking forward to the uh, second tally and we'll get uh, some MPs returned. Hasn't it been really the worst night ever for the Scottish Conservatives? You don't, don't have any seats at all in the first well, You've got to look at what the people's expectations were at the start of this uh, campaign. We've actually increased our uh, share of the vote in this, if you look at the polls throughout the period of the campaign. I think we've run what, by all accounts, and uh, is, is rated as one of the best campaigns uh, ever in an election in Scotland, and we're going to have a significant presence in the Parliament. So I'm looking forward to that and to being part of that group. What's happened to the Conservative tradition, though, in Edinburgh, in Edinburgh Pentlands? I mean, this was Tory for decades. Why is it impossible to get it back? Well, we will be getting it back. I mean, we took one step tonight, and it wasn't enough. Uh, but I'm sure we can win it back at subsequent general elections, both for the House of Commons uh, and uh, for the uh, Scottish Parliament. It's well within our grasp, remains well within our grasp. Well, of course, you'll be getting uh, into the Scottish Parliament by the side door on the uh, list uh, mm -hmm. seat tonight. At least that's what, uh, what we fully expect. Now, will that be the same? 
do you credit the um, first past the post MPs? Do they have? Do they count more than the uh, MPs off the list? No, I don't think anybody is going to have FPP uh, or a PR list after the name when they when well, the credits go Well, there's been talk of it tonight. Up. Well, I don't think that's right. There's no first and second class members. What people are looking for in the parliament are effective advocates uh, of uh, party policies, and that's what they're going to get with me and the colleagues who will be joining me on the Scottish Conservative benches. Surely they won't carry quite the same weight, though, when uh, you know you go in off the list after you've been defeated. In a, in a contest like this. Well, that's this. not the experience in other countries uh, who have uh, systems uh, similar uh, to this. Uh, as I say, what matters is not how you got there, it's the fact that you are there and it's what you do in the job, on the job, uh, in the Scottish Parliament. And I am convinced that we will be significant players and that tonight marks the first step forward for the Scottish Conservatives and we'll be building on that in the general election in 2001 or whatever. David McClatchy, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much now for that. And uh, Mark and Bruce, um, the predictions are that um, after Nicol Stephen winning that, uh, such is the vote, that Labour will simply get a top-up seat uh, in the North East and it will actually cancel each other out. Uh, well, yes, that's in fact the case and that's how the system works. But I think it's a great result for Nicol Stephen because it's been a long, as he said himself, a long road back and he's fought very hard. And I think there's a lot of people actually across parties who will see it as, as pretty well deserved for just sticking at it. Um, and you've also, you've also got um, a guy in Butte. Well, my understanding is in any case that we, we've won 12, that is, uh, uh, all the 11 seats we were effectively defending and we've gained one. Um, what I'm interested in, however, is that we, the better we're doing on the first vote, we seem to be doing rather worse on the second vote. Well, we're, we're not actually sure about that yet, but we are very close, David Denver, aren't we, to uh, the Glasgow regional seat, which might, in fact, we're just hearing, uh, might be good news for yeah. Tommy Sheridan. Yes, I mean, it's, it's clear that um, people haven't followed the advice of the parties and voted the straight first vote and second vote. Well, they're certainly must, celebrating. They think, think they've done it. Tommy Sheridan. They think they've done it clearly. Um, the carry on because we're not yet which in a position is, to have that declaration. You know, which is a rational strategy under the system that's, that, that's been uh, agreed. Because if you think Labour's going to win all the seats in Glasgow, there's absolutely no point voting Labour with your second vote. It just isn't. And, and, and so, uh, you know, people would then perhaps, we think maybe have voted in some numbers for Tommy Sheridan, but they might have also voted Green and, and for all the other, yeah, and which is nice, adds a bit of variety, but it's, it's a rational strategy for people to follow for voters. There's probably some speculation, Kirsty, as to whether, um, you know, there was some speculation in advance of the vote as to whether people understood the system, whether they thought they, they had to vote for a different party at the second one. Frankly, I always thought that was um, a, a little bit misplaced, because I'm sure the people grasp the, 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 the purpose of the, 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 the new voting system. I think, frankly, just as David says there, they've taken the chance to spread their vote. They've gone for the, the rainbow option rather than voting the party line on one and two. They've split the ticket, as the Americans would say. Yeah, I mean, despite uh, Tom McKay, what, uh, in fact, the Daily Record said was make mine a double, make mine a juror. I mean, people actually chose to split their vote. There we can see Tommy Sheridan there. And we can also <laughs> see there that Liberal Democrats win Keith Ness, Sutherland and Easter Ross. So Tommy Sheridan confident there, but of course we haven't got that result yet. But the thing is about that the regional list is that the returning officer, having worked out the list, has then got to go and take down the names of all the, the people that have been successful from the different parties. So from that point of view, it's quite a, a long process between actually having the final vote in and the returning officer being able to come up and announce who's made it to the parliament from the list. And that will, of course, be repeated um, throughout the country. Yes, indeed, of course. And the list, of course, contains as many as a dozen or, or, or 14 names in some, in some of the regions of parties, of individuals standing as a group of independents, standing as, a, as on the party list as well. So it'll take a fair old while if we actually have to uh, endure the declaration of that. But once these results start to come through, but, it's going to make a big change to the final outcome. But it looks like as if he's got 7% of the vote across the region as a whole, which of course takes him over the limit to getting into the Scottish Parliament. You know, bizarrely having less in this, though, than in his own constituency. Yeah, I think he's in. I mean, I think it's, I think it's going to be Canavan and Sheridan. As so, the, as the two, um, Tom McCabe, that'll be an interesting prospect, having um, yeah, this yeah, uh, Scottish yeah. Socialist Party uh, uh, and uh, <coughs> Dennis Canavan uh, giving Labour quite a hard time. I don't know, necessarily know that they would give Labour a hard time. I think it might be an interesting well, prospect might. for Tommy Sheridan if he finds himself siding up with the Conservatives, for instance, <laughs> in a new Scottish Parliament. And let's uh, see how Tommy Sheridan goes back to Glasgow and explains that to people. Sorry, you know, basically you can see Tommy Sheridan might actually side with the Tories well, to get rid of tuition fees. I think that's perfectly possible. Well, if he has to do that, but he may also find himself doing that on, on other issues. So, I mean, Tommy Sheridan, I don't think, is very complimentary of other uh, political parties per se. And if he has to line up with them, 
uh, because he may now find himself in a position where he's got to deal in real politics and uh, if he has an influence, well, presumably he has a, to try presumably and justify himself. Well, presumably as a councillor in Glasgow, he's been dealing in real politics, Tom McCabe. I mean, you're a councillor yourself. Yeah. Well, he may, have been, he may have been dealing in politics in Glasgow, but he's, he, he's been in the luxurious position of being something of a hero in safety where he could uh, very often adopt populist positions knowing that he would never have to deliver on them. And I think he may be in a, a slightly more... A difficult I mean, position down you, in the you, Parliament. I mean, you suggest he's a maverick, but he's nearly going to get the same vote as the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives, so perhaps he's not just so much of a maverick as you might suggest. Well, I think he will be, as it stands at the moment, he, will, he it looks as if he'll be there himself, and I think the Liberals will have a, a bit larger representation than Tommy Sheridan will have. Uh, Lord Strathclyde, do you look forward to the Tories in the Scottish Parliament uh, voting alongside Tommy Sheridan, the Scottish Socialist Party? Well, what uh, David McCletcher has said is we'll do business with anybody who signs up to our programme. And if Tommy Sheridan I thought you were doing that, it issue by issue. I don't think you can well, seriously we'll expect it, people we'll, to sign on, up on to your issue, program. Of course, we'll do it on issue by issue basis. And uh, uh, we talked earlier on about the cooperative nature of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, that is true. And the Tory party wishes to be part of that cooperation. Uh, and uh, we have laid out a list of things that we are keen on. And if other parties come and join uh, with us in that, then that will be... To but I mean, it's funny because you're talking about consensus politics, but actually it's going to end up seeming a lot more volatile than Westminster politics. Uh, I agree with that. I think it will be more uh, volatile. It depends, of course, what happens this weekend. If uh, Donald Dewar and Jim Wallace do manage to uh, do their tie-up, and there's an exchange of the keys for the ministerial motors, uh, then obviously um, it will be less volatile because there will be a firm agreement as to uh, the way forward. And that is uh, the, it's the outcome of that meeting that we uh, we'll wait to see with some interest. Well, Mark and Bruce, it looks as if um, Tommy Sheridan got 18,000 votes on the list in Glasgow and the Liberal Democrats got 18,500. That's not very good for you. Well, I mean, it means we get a seat in Glasgow, and I don't know when we last had a Liberal Democrat. Well, we did, in fact, have Roy Jenkins uh, did, for, for a few years. But, I mean, we, <laughs> yes, we, uh, who's the kind of um, PR meister for uh, well, Tony but, Blair? But so, I mean, and I think, I mean, the whole point about this system is you, you keep talking about power broking and, and the politics of it. It's about regional representation. It actually does mean that Glasgow will have a proper representation the way the people voted. But in in all, sorts of other, all sorts of other countries where there's proportional representation and there ends up being instability and short-lived parliaments and so forth. I mean, when you have people thrown up tonight, like Tommy Sheridan and obviously Dennis Cannon, a huge local following, that repeated at Westminster, and we, of course we've got Martin Bell's independent Westminster anyway, but at Westminster, it could have a profound, I mean, a profound impact on the political system in Britain. Well, it could. I mean, whether we use this system or a different system. But I think what you've got to start with is, do you want to have a parliament which is representative mm. of the way people vote? If that's how people have voted, um, then if you're turning around and saying, well, we don't want it to elect people we don't like or don't approve of, and I think the Labour Party have got to accept and have some indications of what it means that a significant number of people in Glasgow have voted for Tommy Sheridan's party. And it's not something you can ignore or dismiss. They voted for the party. It's a socialist party. And it's all right, one MSP. But the Labour Party have got to decide whether or not they address that, ignore it, or, or believe it's not important. But, I mean, given that um, proportionality is everything, how would you feel, though, if Labour and the Liberal Democrats don't reach that magic 50% and have to form a coalition? Well, at the end of the day, as in any parliament, it's the seats in the parliament that determine the vote and the outcome of any policy and programme, and that has to be the way uh, it, it's applied. Uh, the truth at the end of the day is this is a different style of politics, and whilst the Tories are trying to attack it, I think the people of Scotland would like to see how it works, and the Tories would be well, I think, advised to keep their powder dry. Yeah, no, I, it isn't and necessarily and, 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 going to be unpopular. But Tom McCabe, if it's good enough for um, Edinburgh, then presumably it's good enough for Westminster. Well, that may well be the case, and I think that's still to be decided on. But let's, I, mean, I think Scotland often has uh, provided an awful lot of lessons for the United Kingdom, and perhaps we'll produce other lessons through this system. Perhaps the tuition fees will be your poll tax. Well, I don't think that's the case. I mean, I think, I think there are other parties that, who are coming to this new parliament who have a point of view in tuition fees, and they've said an awful lot about it. But what I, I think what they haven't said is how they're going to deal with the real cap on university places and how they're going to replace that finance. And as we, as we form this parliament, people, rather than just take populist positions, are going to have to explain themselves there. Well, let's have a look at, um, at 10 past five in the morning. Let's have a look at some of the results now. Take, starting first with the Garland Butte. There we have it, uh, George Lyon for the Liberal Democrats on uh, 11,226. SNP followed by Labour, followed by Conservative. 
looking now at Dundee East, uh, John McCallion there. Uh, often a thorn in Labour's flesh, but there he is happily, and he's a member of the Cabinet. Uh, moving on to Renfrewshire West, and uh, Tricia Godman gets in, uh, Norman Godman's wife in in Renfrewshire West. And then we can go uh, straight oh, to Ross Cromartie Sky, and there we have Edinburgh Mr. Monroe. And let's go now to the, uh, the Edinburgh Central Declaration. 55.8%. The votes cast for each candidate were as follows. Brian Duncan Arlingham, Independent Democrat, Campaign for Real Democracy, 364. Sarah Boyack, the Scottish Labour Party candidate, 14,224. <laughs> Jackie Lowell, Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, 6,018. <laughs> Ian Hume McKee, Scottish National Party, 9,598. <laughs> Andrew Bruce Miles, Scottish Liberal Democrats, 6,187. <laughs> William Wallace, Braveheart, 191. <laughs> Kevin John Williamson, Scottish Socialist Party, 830. <laughs> and I declare that Sarah Boyack has been duly elected to serve in Parliament. And that's uh, Scottish another Scottish woman Scottish back Scottish. in Edinburgh Central for Labour. And we can go straight over now because uh, Colin White is with Nicol Stephen in Aberdeen. Thank you very much indeed, Kirsty. The first some questions. I'm Nicol Stephen, who's uh, the Victoria's candidate. Congratulations, Nicol. Uh, after you. eight years, you're, you're an MP in effect again. Yeah, a, a stunning result tonight for the Liberal Democrats in Aberdeen South. But right across Aberdeen, we've done well and I think confounded a lot of those opinion polls. So a, a great result, an extra first-past-the-post seat. Our number one target seat in Scotland has been successfully um, brought home for the Liberal Democrats. Well, you say a stunning result, but your vote is actually down, isn't it, on your general election results? We've got a, a swing in our favour of over 6%. We need a swing of less than 4% to win. But less people voted for you. I mean, it's 12,000 uh, two years ago. It's uh, 11,300 now. Well, the, the important thing is that more people voted for us than anybody else. And the only reason that there's a, a fall in the actual total number of votes um, although an increase in our percentage sh share, a very significant increase, is because of this low turnout, which has obviously been a, a disappointment right across Scotland. But encouragement for the SNP in the constituency because they're up a couple of thousand. I, I don't see encouragement when you come forth, and the SNP came forth. Very disappointing for the Conservatives, who almost beat them for fourth place. But uh, right across the city, and indeed across the North East, the Conservatives seem to be imploding and doing far, far worse than their 1997 low water mark, or everyone thought it was a low water mark. So a very important result for us, helping us to, to I believe, play a pivotal role in the new parliament. I was going to ask you about this. Uh, how, does, how do these results for the Liberal Democrats in the North East tonight, which is, you say have been encouraging, how do they play across the country as a whole? And I, I think they're very important. I think the Liberal Democrats are going to have a, a powerful voice in the new parliament. I think that will help areas like Aberdeen and the North East the borders, the highlands, the island areas, to have a, a stronger voice. The Liberal Democrats will, will stand up against central belt domination of the new parliament. And it looks like we're going to have an influential position because the, the people of Scotland have made it quite clear that they don't want any party to have unlimited power. And that means a, a new era for politics in Scotland, indeed, a new era of cooperation and partnership in politics for the whole of Britain. And that means coalition. It means that we've got to discuss these things um, quickly, soon, over the next couple of days, but there are going to be no announcements and uh, uh, no formal declarations until the new group of, of Liberal Democrat uh, members of the Scottish Parliament gets together on Saturday, and then following that, there's a, a further meeting of the party executive on Sunday. So for the moment, the important thing is to concentrate on the, the victory, the successes of the night, doing better than the, the pundits or the opinion polls predicted. And uh, tomorrow, we've got some very important work and very important discussions to get into. Uh, to, dis to discuss the, the future shape of the new parliament and the government of Scotland. Well, I'll leave you to open the champagne in privacy later on. Nicola Stephen, thank you very thank much you. indeed. We expect a regional list work to begin here within the next few minutes and uh, results there within the next few hours. Back to you. Thank you very much. I hope not in the next few hours. I hope we're going to hear something a little uh, earlier than that. But Nicola Stevens is uh, concentrating in victory and worrying about coalition later. And someone else who seems to be concentrating in victory now is Tommy Sheridan, who's with Anne McKenzie. Indeed, Christy, thanks. Tommy Sheridan, an extraordinary result. Did it exceed your expectations? 
Well, I think for a small political party that's been formed six months ago, we really have made a tremendous uh, breakthrough in relation to this election. I've got to say we are disappointed with the coverage that we got um, as far as the Scottish Socialist Party is concerned. We're usually lumped in with others. Hopefully we won't be lumped in with others now because we're not others. We're the fifth political party in Scotland and we're putting socialism back on the agenda in Scotland. And you obviously took your vote from Labour. We, we took our vote across the board, you know. There were, there were a lot of SNP supporters who have got socialist feelings as well. Majority of voters were obviously disillusioned Labour supporters, many, many pensioners who were voting for us because they feel let down by new Labour. Um, and we've got to make sure we repay that faith in, in the Holyrood Parliament by raising the issues of poverty, of pensioners' rights, and making sure that we argue for the redistribution of the massive wealth that exists in Scotland. So looking ahead to that Parliament, what kind of people do you see yourself working with? Uh, Dennis Canavan, another independent. We've heard of the um, possibility of some left-wing Labour MPs trying to form a sort of a socialist romp, as it were. Are these the kind of people you're looking toward? Well, I've worked with uh, Dennis proudly in previous campaigns against the poll tax, against water privatisation. I hope I can work with Dennis again in terms of putting socialism on the agenda in Holyrood. Anyone who wants to improve the living and working conditions of ordinary working class people will get my support. But let's make sure that the priority for this parliament is solving the poverty, which is a blight in our society. Are you going to work on an issue by issue basis then? Absolutely. It'll be issue by issue. We won't be going into any formal alliances with anyone. This is about political independence for the Scottish Socialist you, Party. You would vote, for example, on tuition fees with the Tories, as uh, Labour was suggesting uh, in We studio. will vote with anyone who wants to abolish tuition fees, but we will be adding an amendment, which is for the reintroduction of student grants. It's no use abolishing tuition fees unless we reintroduce student grants as well. Right, Tommy Sheridan, thank you very much thank indeed. You Congratulations. Kirsty. And there's some unexpected drama tonight. You may remember that uh, the returning officer in Dumfries last time around the general election, James Smith, was quite a colourful character. Uh, berating people in the hall for not being quiet when he was actually giving his declaration. Well, tonight he's gone one step further. I should say good morning. This morning he's done, gone one step further because he's now suggesting that everybody go home from the count, get some sleep and come back and complete the regional vote, which should be pretty well a nightmare for most of the candidates. And uh, presumably as all these councillor workers are getting paid, they should stay put and go on with it. A beer. Yes, indeed, Kirsty. In actual fact, it isn't the Dumfries returning officer's uh, shout here. It's all dependent on the returning officer in air. The reason we may not be able to bring you the result of the regional vote for the south of Scotland is because there's a major hold-up in air. The first vote for the first past the post uh, vote uh, showed just a five-vote difference between... We will come back to you. We're going straight for the regional result in Glasgow. Scottish Liberal Democrats, 18,473. Scottish National Party, 65,360. Scottish Socialist Party, 18,581. <laughs> Scottish, Scottish Unionist Party, 2,283. Socialist Labour Party, 4,391. Socialist Party of Great Britain, 309. And Bridget McGeehan, 221. On the basis of these votes cast, the members who have been elected as additional members to represent the region of Glasgow to the Scottish Parliament are as follows. First on the list was Nicola Sturgeon, SN, sorry, SNP, Scottish National Party. Second is Dorothy Grace Elder, Scottish Nationalist Party. Third is Kenneth G James Gibson, Scottish National Party. Fourth is William Aiken, Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party. Fifth is Thomas Sheridan, Socialist, Scottish Socialist Party. Six is Robert Edward Brown, Scottish Liberal Democrats. And seventh is Sandra White, Scottish National Party. Well, um, there we have it, the regional result from Glasgow. And uh, Laura Strathclyde, you have your first uh, member of a Scottish Parliament returned uh, under the list system. Well, Breathing a huge sigh of relief? Uh, well, I, I think it, it was not entirely unexpected and... Uh, uh, and anyway, this is, this, is, this is part of the system that we've now got. Uh, so, uh, Glasgow will have a Conservative representative, and, and I haven't had that for And you're running neck and neck with years. the Scottish Socialists. And we're running neck and neck with the Liberal Democrats as well. Right, let's, let's go straight back over now to Abir Parks to hear more about this story, about why we actually may not get the regional uh, vote from the South West. Abir, can you tell us um, exactly what's happening in air, first of all, with that first vote on the recount? Yes, indeed. The first pa past the post votes are counted first and after that the regional votes. The hold up uh, is that we're having to have a, a second recount of the first past the post 
votes in air. There were only five votes between Phil Galley for the Conservatives and Ian Walsh for Labour. So we're undergoing a, a second uh, count there, and that's likely to take another two hours. It's only then uh, that the staff in air would begin counting the regional votes. And it's been suggested that the returning officer there might feel that his staff right. are too tired to, uh, to deal with that. Again, Abir, we're about to get the Inverness result in Inverness East. Election, Inverness East, Nairn and Lochaber constituency. I, Arthur McCourt, returning officer for the Scottish Parliamentary constituency of Inverness East, Nairn and Lochaber, hereby declare that the total votes cast for each candidate was as follows. Joan Nicol Aitken, the Scottish Labour Party candidate, 13,384. Fergus Stuart Ewing, Scottish National Party, 13,825. Donnie Fraser, Scottish Liberal Democrat, 8,508. Mary Elizabeth Scanlon, the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, 6,107. There were 136 spoilt votes. And we have it then, um, Inverness Stuart East, Nairn Ewing and Loch Aber. That is the first new seat for the SNP, Fergus Ewing, making Fergus Ewing and his wife, uh, Margaret Ewing, partners uh, in a Scottish Parliament. Fergus Ewing took that from Labour with 13,825. That's SNP in 33, Labour in 32, Liberal Democrats in 20, Conservatives in 15. And the change is from 1997, SNP up 4%. And uh, we'll hear a little bit, a little bit from Fergus Ewing. A very long night indeed. And also for the efforts of all of your officers who have been so effectively uh, and efficiently uh, ensuring that this first new election system has been carried out so well in this constituency. May I also thank the police, although I understand that their services have not been in any way seriously tested this evening. And perhaps also the postmen and post ladies the ideas hearts, whose lives. The ideas in our heads, and we want to transform Scotland. We want to create a new Scotland for a new millennium, a Scotland where the massive wealth and resources of our country are used for the millions of ordinary working men, the length and breadth of Scotland, not for the millionaires. I've got to say, brothers and sisters, that the media hadn't predicted this. The experts got it wrong. Perhaps if some of the experts lived in the housing schemes of Glasgow and Scotland, they wouldn't get it wrong because they would know the type of feeling that exists among ordinary people who have been neglected for far too long and who are completely disillusioned with the grey men and the grey suits with the grey ideas. Well, let's have some new colour. I'll finish by saying to you, because I don't want to keep you too late and Thank the Polish and everybody else. No, often I thank the Polish, but I'll thank you anyway. <laughs> wait, wait till he's left me again, aye. I'll finish by saying this. Nicola mentioned tuition fees and a supporter 100%. But let's make sure that along with tuition fees, we reintroduce student grants as well, so that working class kids can get an education. Let's ensure that there's a pensioner's charter introduced, that free TV licenses, free travel and public transport the purchasing of fuel vouchers for our pensioners to make sure none of them die from hyperthermia in a country that's so rich in energy. And let's also make sure that we abolish the council tax and introduce a fairer system of local taxation which taxes the rich and the wealthy and make sure that ordinary families and small businesses don't pay as much. That way we can use the parliament to redistribute some of the wealth that exists in our country. Thanks, every single one of you, for a brilliant job. Uh, Tommy Sheridan there making his own stamp on tonight's uh, election coverage. And now we can go for a third time back to Abir Parks. Very, very briefly, Abir. Um, so basically, the boxes for the regional vote coming from air haven't even been opened yet. They haven't even been opened yet. It's going to be another two hours before we get the first past the post result. 
and it's believed the returning officer may feel his staff are too tired to begin the regional count and may suspend it until later in the day. And obviously until we have the full picture from the south of Scotland, an announcement can't be made here for the overall regional picture. So there may be a suspension here until later on this afternoon. Abir Parks, thank you very much. We're going straight now to Edinburgh East for the declaration there. Edinburgh East and Musselburgh. The percentage poll was 60.87%. The votes cast for each candidate were as follows. Jeremy Ross Balfour, the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, 4,600. <laughs> Susan Catherine Deacon, the Scottish Labour Party candidate, 17,086. Michael Francis Joseph Heavey, Independent of London, Independent of You, 134. Kenneth Wright McCaskill, Scottish National Party, 10,372. Marjorie Thomas, Scottish Liberal Democrats, 4,100. Derek White, Scottish Socialist Party, 697. And I declare that Susan Catherine Deacon has been duly... So there we have it, Susan Deacon, who uh, was the only person to win an appeal against rejection by the Labour Selection Panel, has been safely returned to the Edinburgh Parliament. Not only that, she is set to be one of their stars and may even take the education portfolio. The vote there, 46% for Labour, SNP 28, 12 for Conservatives, 11 for Liberal Democrats. And we can see the change, Labour down 7, SNP up 9, and Conservatives down 3. Um, at this point, we're joined by um, Henry McLeish, the Scottish Office Minister, um, safely returned to the Edinburgh Parliament. Henry McLeish, before we talk about anything political, let's just deal with the shambles at some of the counts. Um, whose responsibility was it to put in place, I mean, you know, enough people and substantially more money was spent than was spent at the general election and still went to a position where the region, some of the regional boxes haven't even been opened. I mean, presumably the electorate is not being well served. Well, Chris, I'm, I'm concerned because, I mean, we, our Scottish office officials have been in long discussions with the returning officers and we made a special plea. This is a special night for Scotland. We wanted to get the Parliament result dealt with. And of course, there's a tremendous frustration amongst the councillors because they have to wait anyway till 10 o'clock. And obviously, this situation in, in air maybe couldn't have been foreseen, but they've had a recount in Inverness. They're having a recount in Dundee. And I can't for the life of me think that they should be sending people home because we want to get the result. And every effort has been made by the Scottish office to get that result but to us. You and the Scottish office can't lift the phone and say you are not allowed to go home. That is up to this. the returning officer, all powerful, omnipotent. V very much so. And I think this is a curious phenomenon in Scottish uh, civic life. Um, because once we issue instructions, once we detail the resources, once we detail the number of ballot boxes, then it's very much up to them how they run the count. But I have to say, um, even, at this stage, even at this stage, I would urge the people in air, if humanly possible, to rethink get on with it. It's a very special night and we don't want to be going away from this um, with results incomplete. Well, if it's being done elsewhere, recounts, carrying on, please think again and let's get on with it. Well, that, that is a message to air. Please just buckle down and get on with it because presumably the knock-on, of course, is in the local elections, which there's no question of even beginning to count the local elections. Well, I'm sure the other members of the panel will agree that, that, that councillors who have been very active are going to literally wait for two days from the polls opening on the Thursday to getting a count late on Friday with Saturday intervening. It's not good, and I would just hope that we continue and let the local government uh, people have their say after 10.30 tomorrow. If there's any knock-on effect, it could delay the local government count till well into Friday evening, which is, which is frankly not acceptable. Well, the problem is there's a working time directive apart from anything else. These people have been working since 10 o'clock last night, so it may be physically impossible to carry on. But um, Peter Snow, uh, you have details from Glasgow. Please, let's hear everything. Yes, we've got the detailed result from Glasgow and how Tommy Sheridan did it. Kirsty, uh, of course, as we know, uh, all 10 of the constituency seats went to Labour, the great big red slab. They're making Glasgow completely going down to the uh, Labour Party in the constituency seats. But they trotted up the second votes in Glasgow. These are the ones that award, of course, the top-up seats. 112,000 to Labour. Nearly half there, in fact, just over half there, the SNP. The Tories have got some, Liberal Democrats have got some. And look over here, the others in Glasgow with 39,688. A lot of those, of course, Scottish Socialist Party votes. Now, there's the share, then, of those second top-up votes 
the regional list votes in Glasgow. People's second ballot paper all added up. Now, that's the share. We can bung it up at the top of the screen there. And that share there will decide how the proportion of the seats right the way across Glasgow is allocated so that it more or less matches that share of the vote. Now, there's Labour with the 10 constituency seats. Let's just see what happens now to the list of candidates down the bottom here and how they were awarded uh, seats in the top-up list. There we have four then going down to the SNP, one going to the Tories, Bill Aitken has picked up a seat there, Robert Brown takes the Liberal Democrat seats, just scraping in there, 8%, 7% of the vote, and so they get seats. Now let's see what happens to these others. 15% altogether over here, the SSP, the Scottish Socialist Party, Tommy Sheridan's party, with 7% uh, altogether there, just enough to award Tommy Sheridan himself the seat, none of his... Uh, None of the other people on his list get one, but there he is, Tommy Sheridan's made it. There is the profile of the seats down the bottom there. Notice how they match the profile of the votes up at the top. So you have here proportional representation in Glasgow. All five parties here represented uh, in Glasgow. Uh, nothing like this for a very long time with the constituencies dominated totally by Labour normally. Kirsty. Thanks very much indeed, Peter. And uh, before we go on for a little more discussion about these other parties, let's get a state of the parties so far after 75 of 129 MSPs have been elected. It's many to come still on the first past the post, some to come still on the first past the post, most of them to come on the regional lists. So this we have is 75 MSPs elected, that is first past the post plus, plus Glasgow. And that's Labour on 49, SNP on 11, Liberal Democrats on 12, Conservatives on one and others two. That's Tommy Sheridan and Dennis Canavan. Uh, state of the parties after the first vote after 68 results Labour 49, SNP 7, Liberal Democrats 11, others 1. And then there we have it building in the second vote after one region declared on the regional votes. SNP have picked up four from the list Liberal Democrats 1, Conservative 1, and others 1. Um, a share of the vote there, share of the first vote. Labour on 39, SNP on 29, Conservative on 15, uh, Liberal Democrat on 14 and others on 3. And on the second vote, 36 for Labour, 27 for the SNP, 14 for Conservatives, 12 for other and 11 for the Liberal Democrats. And BBC forecast based on 75 results is that Labour will have 57 seats in the Scottish Parliament, the SNP will have 35 that is well below the 40 that they did hope to have. Conservatives, 18, Liberal Democrats, 7, and others, 2. Um, Brian Taylor, first of all, what about the, this business of the others? I mean, Tommy Sheridan made it, but the Greens never made it. I mean, there was a... It's not looking like it for the Greens, really, is it? Just glancing Anywhere at some in the of the country. It's not looking like it. They're at about 3 4% in most of the regions, with some of those regional votes beginning to, to tally up. As I say, they need about... Five, six, or seven percent across the region. The regional result for Mid Scotland and Fife. We're just picking that up here in the front there. We can have that regional result for Mid Scotland and Fife. Uh, and just recapping, also yep. one other party, Kirsty, the Highlands and Islands Alliance, who were looking to win on the second vote. Uh, it's not looking like happening. happening well, why for not them talk either. us through the second vote in Mid Scotland and Fife? Well, in, indeed, we're seeing there the, the the SNP doing relatively well by comparison with the the, the Labour Party. Vote Mid Scotland and Fife, a curious blend of obviously the the, the, the the five seats, one of which is represented by Henry McLeish, who's with us here in the studio. But it, it moves north then into the the Tayside territory, where the SNP can expect to do relatively well. Not a bad vote there for the for the, the, the Tories and the Liberal Democrats either. So that should produce a reasonable spread of, of seats. I'm not sure if we've had the, the seats forecast, but there, well, yeah, we, there can we are. See, we can see the state of the parties after the 82, which takes in Mid-Scotland and Fife now. Yeah. So we're in a position to look at that uh, state of the parties. There we have Labour on 49, SNP on 14, Liberal Democrats on 13, Conservative on 4, and two others.